Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus, the resurrection and the life. Well, it's time for us to gather around the table of truth. And I'm excited about what God is ministering through his word. This subject of spiritual adaptation is stirring up your faith, is stirring up my faith, is increasing our desire to be able to know that in the midst of the things that we're facing in our present world today, God has called those who are part of his family to be mindful that he is at work. He is doing a work that no man can stop. And he's working through the body of Christ. He's working through those who have the spirit of God on the inside of their heart of faith. Well, again, thank you for gathering with me around the word today. God has a word for your life. God has a word that he's speaking right there where you are on your spiritual journey. And that word is designed to enrich you, to enlighten you, to equip you, that you may be God's vessel of honor. Well, let's pray and we're going to go right into our lesson. Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy that follows us every day, Father. We give you the praise and the glory because you are the Lord most high. You are the God of the everlasting covenant. You are the Christ. You are the living word. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. We acknowledge that your name alone is worthy of praise. We give you glory and thanks for your steadfast love, your faithfulness, Father. And we magnify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We declare that Jesus is King. He is Lord. He is the majestic one. He's the Savior. He's the deliverer. He's the Messiah. And we give you all the praise and glory. Now, Father, we ask that you will speak in our hearts of faith. We have put our trust in you, Jesus. We have put our faith in the living word of God. We pray now in the name of Jesus that you will meet us right here in the word, Father, and you will minister to us through the word of truth. We give you all the glory and honor in the wonderful name of Jesus, the Christ. Well, we're talking about spiritual adaptation. Go ahead and take your Bibles and go back to 2 Samuel chapter 22. Well, we are looking at the life of David and how God used David in the midst of his enemies, in the midst of King Saul. God used David to teach him or to train him in righteousness. And one part of spiritual adaptation is that you and I, as I often say, we are not called to just survive, but we are called to thrive, to grow, to develop, to mature, to flourish, and to prosper in this present world that we're in. The world uh, that we're in, there are people who don't have Christ. They don't have the hope. They don't have the light. They don't have the revelation of the knowledge of God's word that you and I have. And we know that God is at work in the midst of what's going on. God is fulfilling his covenant promises that he has revealed in his word. So in 2 Samuel 21, in verse number one, the scripture says, then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Boy, that was a great day in the life of David. That was a a great day to be able to look back in the rear view mirror of the process and know that he's in the season of progress because of the training in righteousness that God took him through during that time. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it reads like this, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete in equipped for every good work. Did you get that? For training in righteousness. So God uses his word in order to train his children in righteousness. Well, in our last lesson, we saw that David in this particular day where he begins to release his song and we see this song also repeated in Psalms 18. David began to release this song of praise of thanksgiving unto the Lord. And we said that David acknowledged uh, the, the perfected power of God through that training in righteousness, it trained him in the attributes of God. We also said that it trained him in the power of God and he trained him in the principle of sowing and reaping from a spiritual standpoint. Well, let's go on because I believe there's some more training that God has taken his servant David through. So in 2 Samuel 22, we're going to begin at verse number 29. Listen to what the word of the Lord says. For you are my lamp, O Lord, the Lord shall enlighten my darkness. See, he's still talking about the training that he uh, 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 received during uh, that time in his life where he was on the run, where he was, as folks say, in the process. 
And then he uses this word that, God, you are my lamp. And so I believe the other area of training that David experienced was training in spiritual illumination. Now, this metaphor of a lamp, it described who God was in his life as well as how God brought forth this inner illumination during times when he could not see or understand his life and situations going on around him. I think you and I can relate to that. We don't always just know readily what God's will is and certain will is in certain circumstances in our life, but we know that God is our light and he gives us light. That means God provides us the understanding we need when we need it. And so this is what training in righteousness brings about. It's when our faith is in those fiery like experiences in this world and God uses that as an opportunity to teach us concerning his light, his spiritual illumination that he brings even in the midst of a dark situation. Peter tapped into it in 1 Peter 1, 7. He said it like this, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, our faith will be tried with fire. Fiery like experiences is testing, is producing the genuineness of, of our faith. I think in Psalms 42, if you turn there with me quickly, Psalms 42, it gives us uh, some insight here relative uh, to David. And, and I believe this Psalm was written when David was in one of those dark moments and dark experience when he was uh, perhaps in the cave of Adullam and when he was running from uh, Saul, uh, Saul, King Saul for his life and he shut up in this cave. And then in Psalms 142, listen to what the Bible say. I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path in the way in which I walk. They have secretly set a snare for me. Look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledged me. Refuge has failed me. David is expressing his real feelings, but he's also expressing his real faith. Because in verse 5, he said, I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. Listen, listen. Real emotions have to be introduced to real faith if we're going to be able to express our confidence in God in the midst of whatever we may be facing. So often Christians have a tendency to allow their emotions to erupt their faith. Our emotions should cause our faith to see that this may be the condition but this is my confidence. And that's what David is showing us here. That in the midst of whatever he is experiencing, we know it's not nothing good, but because he's talking about being overwhelmed. He's talking about being in a moment of great distress. But even in the midst of that fiery like experience, we see where David began to exalt God through his faith. That's what spiritual illumination look like. Spiritual illumination will ignite a strength from within that will, able, will enable God's people to be able to overcome every fiery dart of the wicked one with supernatural strength and a resolve that God is good and can fully be trusted. And so you notice in verse number 29, he talks about 
God being a light, his light and God enlightening and giving him that spiritual illumination while in darkness. Look at verse 30. For by you I can run against the truth. For by my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Notice what he's focusing on. The supernatural strength that God supplied him. There is a place in spiritual illumination where when God began to awaken that light of truth on the inside of your heart, you that there, there is a strength, there is a, a spiritual fortification, a spiritual fortifying of the mind where you will gird up a strength from the Lord. And that strength will make you, give you the ability to overcome any truth that's coming against you. Will give you the ability to go through any circumstance that's trying to operate like an obstacle in your life. You see that sometimes spiritual illumination occurs at the end of a fiery faith experience. That is when you went through the process and now you look back and there, there, there's so much that you gained. There, there's so much revelation that God brought through that process. But it's at the end of that process that you gather together the spiritual notes, hallelujah, the spiritual notebook of your journey. And there's so much that God taught you through that experience. The apostle Paul in his letters would often end his letters with uh, giving thanks and acknowledging certain instructions to those who were uh, part of his ministry and part of his team. But I want to read in 2 Timothy 4 because sometimes it's at the end, and some Christians they don't realize it's at the end of the process that God's going to give you some revelation and you're going to be able to bring that revelation, that, that spiritual illumination, and it's going to be just, it's going to be, uh, just settled in your heart. It's going to be part of your journey. It's going to be part of your story. It's going to be part of what inspires you on down the road in your life. You're going to go back to the uh, a file of, of, of how God uh, uh, worked with you and brought you through and taught you all of that when you face another Goliath in your life. And all you got to do is review the notes. All you got to do is refresh yourself with the notes. And it's going to give you strength. To stand strong in the Lord. But listen to the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4. It says like this, be diligent to come to me quickly. He's talking to Timothy and he's letting Timothy to know to be faithful. Timothy was a faithful man. And he said, make sure you put some diligence. Why? Because there's some things that God is still doing in your life, Timothy. There's some work that's still got to be done. And I know you are a diligent, faithful soldier of the Lord. And I want you to put it in your heart that you're going to make every effort to come as soon as possible to join me so that we can continue this work that God has assigned our hands to do. So he says that in verse 9, but then he identifies uh, other individuals who did not finish the work. And all of a sudden, verse 10 says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, and Titus for Dalmatia. So Demas, we know why he forsook, he, he, he stepped away from the assignment. We know why he was willing to forsake God's assignment because of his love for the world. And Christians, we got to check ourselves. We got to ask ourselves, and Jesus become our example. And uh, uh, Jesus become our example. We got to look at how Jesus conducted himself in this world. Jesus lived aloof from the world. He didn't. He didn't fall in this world and get into it and get so tangled into it where he didn't have time to focus on the Father's will. And we as Christians, we as followers of Christ, we got to examine ourselves and ask ourselves, is all this that I'm doing, is all of this demand on my time, is all of this stuff that I'm doing for others, is God orchestrating this? Because God would not pull you away from the assignment of his kingdom in order to take care of worldly affairs. He'll give you a balanced life. He knows what you have to take care of. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, Christians are going to have to re-examine their priorities. And then he said, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful for me for the ministry. Thank God that Mark got on back on course. He had walked away from the ministry. He had walked away from the work in the flesh, out of the will of God. But later on, Paul realized this brother got his act together. And so he tells him, he said, uh, Luke is Luke, the physician, the one who wrote the uh, gospel of Luke in the book of Acts. He said, man, he's right here with me. 
And he said, you know what? Mark has changed. Go get it. He, he can be used now in the work because his heart has been changed. He's got some faith on the inside of him now. And then he goes on and he lists, And Tashias I have sent to Ephesus, bring the cloak and I left with, uh, with coppers at Troas. When you come in the books, especially the part. So he wanted to bring the word. Hallelujah. Make sure when you come, you bring the word. And when you gather together to sit down and listen to the word, you need to have your word right there. And then he said, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his word. Listen, listen, training in righteousness, you don't have to repay people. Paul simply said, you know, the coppersmith, Alexander, he did me much harm. He tried to hurt me. He tried to put out things and hinder the work that God called me to do. He had a spirit of jealousy against me. He wanted to create strife with me. But guess what? Paul basically said, you know what? I released him. I didn't, I didn't let him hinder me. I'll let the Lord repay him. And that's what you got to do with certain people. You got to say, Lord, you know what? You repay them. You know the evil they did. You know the undercurrent spirit they work with. You know the seeds they sowed. You repay them. Then he said, you also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our word. Notice he said, he said, stay away from Alexander. Stay away from that spirit in him, that spirit of influence. And sometimes, boy, you warn certain people. They think you're trying to control them. Listen, when I grew up, there were people my mother told me to stay away from right in the neighborhood. There were relatives, cousins. My mom said, no, you can't go with him. Why? Because she knew of that influence. And as a sh under shepherd, you can see certain spirits working in people. And you get some weak Christian, go over there. Next thing you know, that spirit get on them. And they start operating with a certain attitude. Or they start seeing things that they didn't see. Because of that spirit of influence. So Paul told him, he said, beware of him, for he greatly resisted our words. In our word, Paul mocked him. He mocked him. Why? Because he sows discord. Why? Because he's against the ministry. And the Bible says, mock those who sow discord among you. All right, then it goes on. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against the man. This man got a heart to say, you know what? I'm training in righteousness and I'm not going to let a grudge and, 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 and unforgiveness get in my heart. He said, you know, guess what? At my first defense, everyone forsook me. But guess what? He goes on. But the Lord stood with me in verse 17 and strengthened me so that the message might be preached uh, fully through me and that all the Gentiles may hear. And I also would deliver out of the mouth of the lion. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Man, I'm telling you what. Paul was not walking around with a with a nice robe when he walked in. And, you know, he wasn't walking around with a you know with a party around him protect. Paul was out there. He was down in the, uh, the nit and gritty of things. He was down there, uh, as folks say, he was a foot soldier. Glory to God. He was right there carrying out the will of God, going through different things, but yet honoring God and how he responded. And look at verse 18. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory and uh, forever and ever. Amen. I want us to see this now, that Paul received strength from the Lord. He, he, he wasn't moved by people leaving him. He wasn't moved by people putting their mouth on him. He left that. He, he didn't allow those distractions to get him off course. He focused on the will of God, and he knew that God is my deliverer. He delivered me at that first defense. He gave me supernatural strength, and get this, he threw in a lion. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's like he just said, you know what? And God delivered me from a lion. Man, I tell you what, you and I know for a lion getting ready to attack you and you see God deliver you up. Boy, he got a testimony like David. Hallelujah. David said, God delivered me from the lion and the bear. If he did it then, what he did? He looked back in his training. You got to always remember the training and righteousness that you're experiencing today is going to be used by God to propel you in your future. So don't resist it. Don't let your heart get full of bitterness. You're going to have to trust God because in the midst of that, God will give you spiritual illumination. Listen to Acts chapter 18, verse 9 through 11, another incident in Paul's life. The Bible said, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you and no one is going to attack you and harm you because I have many people in this city. 
So Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of the Lord. I want you to grab this. God spoke to him in a vision. What's that? Spiritual illumination. God can speak by his spirit. He can speak by his word. He can speak through the gifts of the spirit. But you need to know on the inside of you that in the midst of whatever is going on, that God in training and righteousness will train you and spiritual illumination. You will get to a point where you will know like you know your name, whether it's God or whether it's your emotions. You will be able to discern what is of God and what is not of God. All that comes because you are being, you're willing to be trained in righteousness. This training in righteousness, what it does, it stirs up the anointing in our inner man or our spirit man. And then it influences in, uh, the arena of our mind. That is why it's necessary to draw near to God in order that your spirit man will be in tune to the spirit of God and you will be able to discern what is of God and what is of certain emotions within you. Listen, God did not take away your emotions. God did not take away your ability to have positive are negative emotions. But through spiritual illumination, you will be trained in righteousness to the point that you will know when you are hearing from your emotions and when you're hearing from the voice of God. Too many people are being led by their emotions, are being led by, well, you know, this happened, so, so that must be God. It's called, you know, no, no, that God wants us to be led by his spirit. He wants us to be led by his word. He wants us to be led by the gifts of the spirit that he placed in, in operation as the spirit wills. He wants us to be led by spiritual authority in the church, divine order, just like Moses and, and Aaron. They had their particular roles of instruction and are uh, ordained of God. Then you get that old chorus spirit in the church. When that old core of spirit show up, the first thing it does is start looking at the authority and the order and begin to question and put their mouth on it and begin to assume that they are just as well able to do what Moses is called to do. And perhaps you are, but you are not anointed to do it. You will be amazed that people are doing stuff and had been anointed or called by God. Preaching had been anointed and called by God and doing it in human effort. But the day of accountability will come where we all will stand before the Lord and give an account. And I believe we're going to have to definitely give an account that, Lord, I know you spoke this to me because, listen, people are doing stuff out of the flesh and talking about the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. And, and, and when people come at you like that, sometimes they'll come and, and say, well, Pastor, you know, the Spirit of the Lord said to me. And I stop them. I say, stop, stop, stop right there. Communicate with me without trying to take the seal of the Holy Spirit as a means to challenge me relative to the fact how I'm going to respond. People have to stop doing that. You can say, I perceive, or, 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 what, or Pastor, what do you think about this? Or this is something to pray about. But people come with this attitude. They don't go to their boss and go on their job and say to their supervisor, well, supervisor, the spirit of God spoke to me. They don't do that in that setting. They go there and find out what is my tag, my job responsibility. What you know? What time do I have to be here? Or uh, how long is my lunch break? They go right to the world and just what and submit to that order and come in the church and get out of order and try to put the Holy Ghost as a tool uh, as a, as a means to try to intimidate spiritual authority. Well, you got to be strong in the Lord so you can discern that and know that if God spoke it, yes, Amen. Let's do it for the glory of God. But if it's that's your if, if that's your emotions or somebody been talking to you, people will do that. They'll talk to people and talk about certain things. Then they'll come back to meetings and put it out there. Got somebody of spirit, haven't heard from the spirit of God, but just trying to use their position or their influence to do what somebody in that little carnal circle been throwing out there. You, see, you can discern that. Any <laughs> spiritual minded person, they discern that. And you, when you discern it, you pray for the person. Maybe the Lord may have you to address it then. And a lot of times the Lord will tell me, just leave it alone, be quiet. Why? First of all, it is not going to prosper. If it's not of God, it's not going to prosper. And everything, before we make decisions, we know what to do. We go to God in prayer. 
But I want to move on. But listen to Proverbs 20 and 27. The Bible says, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. Notice, the spirit of the, of, of the Lord is that lamp, and it searches what? It searches the deep places of our heart. What, what's our motive? What is it that we are trying to accomplish? What is it that we are trying to do? So the spirit of God go to the deep places of our heart. And then the scripture says, in Psalms 4 to 6 and 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted. in Listen, listen, listen. God will give spiritual illumination, not so much in the midst of, of noise and midst of you shouting and screaming and all this. In that moment where you are alone and before God and you are settled and you are quiet and you don't have no anxiety, you don't have things just pulling your mind, you're not overwhelmed by anything, in that moment of silence, you will know that there is a soft, still voice speaking to you. Go this way. Do this. And I believe we're living in a time where the world is so noisy and so busy that Christians are going to have to begin to step out and consecrate themselves so that we can make sure we're, and God sees that. God sees when you are genuinely seeking him in private. You are genuinely coming to him, praying, even fasting in private. God, and there is no good thing the Lord will withhold from those who walk upright. He's witnessing that, and he will honor that. Well, I think when it comes to spiritual illumination as believers, we're going to have to make sure that we are keeping our spirit man edified, built up. God hasn't called us to be selfish in the kingdom, but he's called us to do what? To build up ourselves. And so in Jude 20, verse 21, 20 and 21, listen to this. Jude, verse 20 and 21. But you, beloved, build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Notice, uh, 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 praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God. So, so listen, listen. There are people, man, they'll go praying in tongues and come out and got no love. Praying in tongues and all they want to do is stand up and rebuke everybody. No, we when we pray in the spirit, we're building up our spirit, man, so we can be more in tune to the spirit of God. And one of the witnesses is that we are more sensitive to walking in love. We are more sensitive to letting the love of God and the love for God and the love for the people of God to be the motivation of our actions. That's why it's important that we what? pray in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because he said, keep yourselves in the love of God. Praying in the Holy Ghost will keep you walking in love. Praying in the Holy Ghost will keep you sensitive to the Spirit of God. Praying in the Holy Ghost will keep you looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And people get it wrong. They think praying in tongues or praying in the Holy Ghost is going to charge them up so they can come out and they can rebuke everybody and they can say all kinds of things. But you got to recognize that God has called us to build up ourselves so we can advance his kingdom and glorify his name. Well, that's training and spiritual illumination. And David, he experiences that. So let's go back to 2 Samuel 22 because there's, there's two more I want to give you. The next one is, not only did he get training in spiritual illumination, but he got training in opposition. We see this because the Bible goes on to say in verse number 40, I want you to come down. We're going to skip some of the verses there, but read it in your own time. It's just, it's just a word. It's a sure word. Hallelujah. And, and verse 40 says, for you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemy so that I have destroyed those who hated me. Look at verse 44. You have also delivered me from the striving of the people. You have kept me as the, you have kept me as the head of the nations. Listen, Christians today, we are so often spoiled by the oil of the world. And as soon as we're doing something for God, the first distraction or the first setback or first delay causes us to question God's divine GPS. What do I mean by divine GPS? I mean goodness, power, and scriptures. Yes, first little thing that could get in the way, Christians will throw up their hands. Or they all look at the devil, the devil, the devil. Don't talk about the devil, talk about God. Talk about what God is doing. 
However, listen, God uses opposition in order to teach us lessons in humility. That's what opposition does. It teaches us lessons in humility. If you look at verse number 40, those uh, verse number 36, listen to this. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarged my path under me so my feet did not slip. And I have... Uh, I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. And I have destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. Look at verse 45. He said, the foreigners submit to me. As soon as they hear, they obey. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. And so we see here that these these it, these uh, this opposition, uh, they became instruments that God used for opportunity for David. And God will use opposition to develop opportunity for us in the kingdom. God provided David all of these opportunities, but it also came with opposition. In the kingdom of God where there is opposition, that is the work of the enemy, there is also opportunity to the work of the exalted king of glory. And verse 49, listen what he said. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Listen, listen. Does he have opposition? Yes. We see it in verse 40. Those who rose up against me. Verse 41. Enemies. Uh, uh, verse 41. Those who hated me. Verse 42. The striving of the people. Yes, what else? Those were op uh, vessels of opposition, instruments of opposition. Listen, right now, God is training you in righteousness, and part of that training is training in opposition. That you and I are to see opposition as an opportunity so that God can be glorified. When opposition occurs, what we have to ask ourselves, what will my character and my conduct look like? Because now, our character and conduct become weapons of might when we're experiencing opposition. Listen to what Titus 2, 7, and 8, what Paul said to this young minister. He said, in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Those who oppose you may be put to shame. Why? Because of your character. Because of your integrity. Because of your conduct. Because of the way you carry yourself as an example of Christ. You're modeling Jesus in front of them. They may not like you. They may not like your leadership. They may not like your authority. They may not like your personality. That's okay. They may try to stop you. That's okay. But you let your character you let your conduct become a weapon of might that God can use to be a witness to them. That's what you're doing. You're being a witness to them of what it looks like to walk with God. And then in Matthew 5, 10 and 12, listen to this. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for they also persecuted the prophets before you. Hallelujah. Jesus said, listen, listen, when you are persecuted for righteousness sake, that's that training in righteousness, for because you are righteous and because you are training and practicing righteousness, this opposition will come against you. Why? Because Satan will use whoever he can. But the Lord said, listen, listen, you are to remember that you don't render evil for evil. You rejoice and be exceedingly glad because your reward is going to be great. Hallelujah. And finally, David gets training, not only in spiritual illumination and training in opposition, but he also gets training in gratitude and glorifying the Lord. Listen to verse number four. 50. Therefore, notice how he concludes this song. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. He is the tower of salvation to his king. 
and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever, ever. So David concludes this song with a direct word of thanksgiving and praise. Notice that this is a commitment to reflect and reveal God's faithfulness and goodness as a witness, notice, to the Gentiles, the outsiders, the unsaved. Hallelujah. That's what the unsaved need to see. They need to see our gratitude and our commitment to praising God and giving him the glory due his name. So he continues to exalt God's attributes. He, here he identified God as, as a tower of salvation. I like the way Proverbs 18 and 10 talks about this tower. Said the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Boy, during that time when they could get in that tower and they could, you know, they, they, they felt so fortified, so protected. They could be above their enemies. They can look down and see what's going on around them. Well protected. So when God is our tower, we are well protected. We are well fortified. Our enemies, they can't touch us. They can't get to us. God has made our feet like deer feet. We are able to leap. We are able to maintain stability. We are able to land straight in the landing spot that God has ordained for our life. And in that, we give him thanks. We give him praise. David could be grumbling, he could be murmuring and complaining, but instead, in the midst of this training, he learned that God is training me how to be grateful, how to offer up thanksgiving and praise to his name. Boy, when you get thanksgiving and praise together, when you're just thanking him and praising him and thanking him and praising him and going back and forth, that's a glorious time. Because a thankful heart reveals my attitude of the heart. A thankful spirit. David's spirit adaptation was birthed out of his training in righteousness. Likewise, for you and I, we will continually experience, I believe, these six areas that I've shared of God's perfecting power through training in righteousness. I, we don't get trained and after what's, you know, it's like most jobs now, they have you to come back and uh, get refresher training. So in the kingdom of God, this training in righteousness never ceases. Because whenever you're in a process, you're in training. And you're not just in training, for, but you're being trained in righteousness. And so in this process, man, as David, boy, he was trained in the attributes of God. He became a great worshiper. That process taught him how to really get to know God, the attributes of God. He was training in the power. He was trained in the power of prayer. He knew how to trust God, but depend on God. He was trained, uh, trained and spiritually sowing and reaping. He sowed good spiritual seeds. He reaped a good harvest. And today we learn he was trained in spiritual illumination. He was trained in opposition. And he was trained in gratitude and praise to the glory of God. I have two faith action questions I want to present to you. The first one is this. In what ways are you seeking to be sensitive to God's direction in your life? You need to sit down and begin to just kind of write down some ways that you are seeking to be sensitive. That's the key thing. Some people want somebody to give them a word from the Lord. Or, or, you know, they want somebody to just make it easy for them. But God wants us to seek him. He said, if you seek me, you'll find me. He said, if you seek me early, you'll find me. In other words, make it the first priority of your day to seek God. Make seeking God a priority. Why? So you can be sensitive. To his direction for your life. So many people are doing their own thing, as I said, and they try to put the Holy Ghost on or the Spirit of God said. And then, you know, when God speaks, especially where there's a, 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 a system of order, you know, you got a husband and wife, God, he's just going to speak to one of them. If they're both born again and have the Holy Spirit, he'll speak to both of them. He'll give a confirmation. Why? Because there's a covenant there. There's, a, there's an order. There's a unity. I've seen, you know, weak men, spiritually weak men, got women running them. Wife come and say, oh, oh, the Lord told me to do this. The Lord told me to do that. And, you know, he don't even go pray. Well, go ahead, whatever. It ain't whatever. God going to call you to the forefront and ask you, Adam, where are you? Yes, God's going to hold you accountable. Well, the same thing in the church. God has an order. He has a system of authority. And it's, it's amazing how God's speaking to people. Uh, 
uh, uh, that's not in authority or got people over him. He ain't speaking to the people that's over them. God, 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 God is not the author of confusion. Hallelujah. Paul didn't just hear God give him a vision and jumped off, you know, jumped up and say, okay, the Lord called me. God instructed him. Now you go and you submit to this particular man that I placed in a certain position and, 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 and you listen to his words. You listen to Ananias. You listen to what he's got to say. You listen to, and that, that's in Acts chapter 9. With, with God, and I, I'm, I'm just, I just want to, uh, uh, God, where Paul had that experience. And it said, uh, and so the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one, for, for one called Saul the Tarf. For behold, he is praying. And but, but, but in verse 10, he said, now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. That's what God did. Paul had that supernatural experience. Paul didn't just jump up and go run to my, the Lord called me. God spoke to that, 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 that prophet. He spoke to Ananias, giving him instruction. Well, that's God's order. God's order. And so I want to encourage people, a lot of people are out of the will of God, going in their own direction, and, and don't recognize God is a God of decency and order. The whole universe is established in order. In the church, Jesus said, if on this rock, I'm going to be in my church. Revelation, the revelation flows through order. The last one, a moments of opposition creating an opportunity for spiritual growth in your life. If so, what does that look like? Moments of opposition. Is it creating opportunities for spiritual growth? It should be because that's part of the training in righteousness. You're going to grow. You're going to develop. You're going to mature. You're going to flourish. You're going to prosper. Hallelujah. In the things of God. Well, we have two announcements. First of all, I want to thank Word Word. Uh, a live church for your faithfulness. This is a great day for us to show forth the unity God has called us to in this ministry. We unite together. We do this thing together for the glory of God. God has uh, imparted uh, to us uh, uh, certain uh, uh, responsibilities and he's entrusted us with certain uh, resources and things, but we join together in honoring the Lord. And so this is our Financial Discipleship Sunday. We're excited about it. If you haven't already sown your Financial Discipleship seed, go out there online, go to the website, text to give, make sure you're honoring God. I'm telling you, when you honor God, God will honor you. And we know that that's the word of God. And we make him a priority in our lives and in, in our relationships and our finances. God is to be exalted above all. And I want to encourage you to make sure you're doing that. Make sure you're exalting God above all. So in the time of trouble, he will be a present help. He will already be there. Why? Because you've been honoring him in your life. You've been honoring him in how you manage your finances. Your finances. You've been honoring him with tithes and offerings. So I want to thank you for being a united one body in Christ here at Word of Life Church with our financial discipleship. Kingdom Men's Ministry. Get ready, men. We'll get ready to gather together for our Father's Day gathering. And uh, uh, we want to make sure all the fathers and your sons, bring your sons. I don't care if they're three years old, four years old, bring them out. We're going to have a time where we're going to get outside the church, go into a venue and just have some great time together. That's going to be the Saturday before Father's Day, uh, June 18, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, uh, Brother Roger Jackson, he's leading that up for us. So reach out to him, get information. Those who are attending in person, you already been uh, meeting uh, after church, getting instructions, coming together so we can have some great quantity of fellowship time together. Hallelujah. And we're excited about that. Well, I, I know you've been blessed by the word because the word is already blessed, anointed, full of power, sharpened in any two-edged sword. I pray that God has spoke, spoke to your heart. And, and there are things that you might need to just go and pray and get God's uh, instructions on. There are things that you uh, may need to just go and get in that quiet place and ask the Lord, what, you know, what is it specific you're saying to me? Uh, I want to be in your will, God. I want to do things in a manner whereby it honors your word. And, and, and God, there may be a time where God may call you to a place of repentance. May in that time, God may say, you need to repent. And that just acknowledge it before God. Hallelujah. And, and God, in Christ, there is forgiveness of sin. So just let your heart be, be, be uh, right with God in the sense of being in faith and, and walking in the things of the Spirit. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus' name.